Hello to our friends joining us via recording. We are wrapping up our discussion of lesson number seven to help us with uh, reminding ourselves of what we worked on yesterday. We worked as groups to fill in the statements that you see here on the slide. These statements describe the various things that we spent time in class yesterday talking about. So for my friends who are here in the chat, I'm going to bounce around uh, just a little bit on, on our slide here to, to help us fill in our blanks. I want to start with, uh, let's see, let's start with this statement right here, because this is, this is a weird word that we talked a little bit about yesterday that might have caught us off guard. When I use this word amphiphilic, can you remind me in the chat, what does amphiphilic mean? Amphiphilic. Yeah, loves water and land, right? Um, we, we gave the example of an amphibian, right? So um, it, it's, it's water loving and water hating at, at the same time. That word amphiphilic, or I, I love amphibians, right? We'll, we'll make that our joke for amphiphilic. When we talk about our list of things at the top, which of those things in particular did we say was amphiphilic which one did we say specifically that partially loved water partially hated it yeah absolutely the the thing that's that's half and half 50 50 are those glycolipids and i appreciate that that tyranny put in the chat for us too the besides the the more technical words for water loving and water hating right are polar and non-polar so the one molecule or the one thing from our list that we see up here that is both polar and nonpolar that's those glycolipids absolutely the glycolipids what um what is the general function of glycolipids why does our skin make them what's their job glycolipids Yeah, glycolipids are all about waterproofing. So I'm going to go back to my waterproofing statement here. Glycolipids are all about waterproofing. Remember that, that they've got their water-hating part, their nonpolar part, that's the lipid part of their name, and then their water-loving part, that's the glyco part of their name. But the big idea with these glycolipids is I spit them out, and it basically makes, we talked about it yesterday, kind of like a raincoat around my cells. Water from the outside can't come in. Water from the inside can't go out. That's gonna help me not lose water. But there's also a downside or a, a bad thing that happens with, with these glycolipids waterproofing my cells. What happens when a cell is covered in glycolipids? Why is that a bad thing for that cell? What's gonna happen to it? Yeah, it's gonna end up dead, right? So the, the problem with glycolipids is, as, as Nicole mentioned, that's going to keep the glucose away from the cells. Glucose, which is a cell's favorite food. So if I don't have glucose, if I don't have my favorite food, that's going to kill me. So when I'm looking at my statement right here, I kill the cells in stratum corn. When I cover those cells in glycolipids, that's going to end up killing them because there's no way for us to get the nutrients that would be dissolved in water. Yeah, so Jacqueline mentioned in the chat that that was one that, they, that her group was confused about. What were our thoughts about this one? Can you guys help me out? What, what well, let me put it this way. What other thing might we have put for this statement here? Yeah, so Jacqueline said her group was toying with keratin. Remember I told you that since we're doing this as, as a group, some of my statements are a little bit tricky. So this is a statement that actually has two right answers. I'm gonna go ahead and switch colors here because my other right answer is keratin. There are, are two things, two strikes against poor stratum corneum. Poor stratum corneum, number one, it has cells that are filled with the keratin protein. That keratin protein takes up all the space those cells can't be alive. That kills them, number one. But number two, the other thing that's killing them is the fact that they're literally starving to death because of those, those glycolipids. Remind me in the chat, we talked about this yesterday, which stratum or which layer 
of the epidermis do I start making glycolipids? Where do I see these guys? Yeah, so we start making them. Let's draw a little arrow here. I start making glycolipids in stratum granulosum. That's where I first make them. I spit them out there, which means that, and it correlates with the fact that stratum granulosum is where cells start to die. Then those cells in stratum granulosum get pushed up through stratum lucidum all the way into stratum corneum. Everybody above stratum granulosum is dead. And they're dead because they can't get nutrients and they're dead because they're full of keratin. So this is one of those statements where I went a little tricky on you. More than one right answer for this one. Poor stratum corneum, they've got glycolipids and keratin working against their, their cells. So those cells in the outermost layer of the skin, very much dead. Hey, so when I, I have this statement right here, this will be a, a tie-in for us here. When we talk about what keratinocytes make, this one should not have been a trick question. What do keratinocytes make? What does the name tell me that they make? Yeah, we, we just, just talked about the protein, right? The protein keratin. Keratinocytes are most of the cells that I find in the epidermis, and they get their name because they make keratin, because they're full of keratin. So the keratin protein made by keratinocytes. Hey, if we want to turn this into trickier than it needed to be, so I wasn't necessarily expecting you to go here, but we'll, as a class, we'll go here together. When I talk about keratin, which of my type of, of cell junctions uses keratin? Which of, of the things that I talked about have keratin inside of them? Yeah, so, so a few of us are chiming in. The type junction, the thing that holds, oh, Jesse says they went there. Look at you guys, you're rocking. So when we talk about the type of cell junction that has keratin in it, the type of cell junction that has keratin in it are called those desmosomes. So the other thing that we could say that keratinocytes make, or, or that they have, if you will, are these desmosomes. That's one of the ways that I hold my cells together. So hey, we can bounce up to our statement up top up here, right? I hold cells together. We just talked about those desmosomes. There is another type of thing that holds cells together. This one should be super obvious, right? What's the other thing that holds cells together? There we go. Yep. I was like, I, I think it should be obvious, but it's a lot of typing. I did make you type a lot there. So type junctions, that's the other thing that holds those cells together. Now, in holding cells together, Desmosomes and tight junctions, they don't work exactly the same way. When we talk about tight junctions, how might you describe um, what's going on with those? If I have a tight junction between two cells, is there space between them? Is there not space between them? Yeah, so we're talking about holding things together really tight. Nothing can get through. Tight junctions, if you remember from the picture, we're basically fusing plasma membranes. Oops, I'm going to run out of space here. Fusing plasma membranes together. That's the whole idea of a tight junction. We're putting things together tightly. So a tight junction fuses those plasma membranes together. Nothing can get through them. Hey, by, by fusing the plasma membranes so that nothing can get through them, that helps me to do another function that we have on, on our list here. Which of my functions that I see right here is also a function of tight junctions? Did we get that, that note with our, our groups? Tight junctions help us to do uh, a few, yeah. So they help us to protect the skin by not letting thing in, things in. Yeah, and then they also help us to waterproof tight junctions. So they protect us by keeping things like bacteria and viruses out. 
Nothing's going to be able to sneak in between those cells. And they waterproof the skin by making sure there's not space for water to sneak in and out. So tight junctions involved in, in protection of the skin, keeping the safe in general, also involved in waterproofing. Uh, I think I missed a question. Jacqueline may have figured it out. How is the structure of the two different? OK, the structure of the two junctions. Um, so, so let me see if I understand your question. So we want to know how the structure of a tight junction is different from a desmosome. Is that correct? Is that the question you're asking, Jacqueline? OK, um, so I'm actually going to put that question to the class because we need to fill in this part right here. When we're talking of desmosomes, do we fuse the plasma membranes of cells together if they're attached with desmosomes? Does anyone remember? Yeah, we, we don't actually fuse the plasma membranes together when we have a desmosome. What we do do when we, we have a desmosome is we make a really strong connection. Because remember that desmosomes are anchored inside the cell to those keratin proteins. And, and we used it or we, we gave the analogy of like when you walk into Walmart and you see all of those, those beams in the ceiling, those metal bars. That's the keratin proteins that are helping to reinforce my desmosomes. Desmosomes make a really strong junction. If you remember, that helps us when we pull in a lot of different directions. So the goal of desmosomes is to make sure that my cells don't fall apart. The goal of tight junctions is to make sure that stuff doesn't sneak in between the cells. Uh, so Nicole asked the question, um, are they hydrophobic attractions? So I think we're, we're mixing a little bit of our terminology. Hydrophobic attractions was, was something we talked about with the tertiary structure of a protein. Um, that that a, a structure by itself, but it is a way that I can fold things into a 3D shape. Um, so my, my desmosomes being strong and my tight junctions preventing stuff from getting through, these, these characteristics don't necessarily have to do with hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. Um, what has more to do with that is when we're talking about the glycolipids waterproofing the skin, that has to do with, with hydrophobic. Um, but, but with desmosomes and tight junctions, it, it doesn't really have to do with their chemistry um, when we're talking about holding things together. Does that answer the question or maybe phrase it in a different way for me so I can answer the right question? OK, so that should answer it for you. Um, let me see. Tierney asked, would desmosomes be used where we have dense irregular, I'm thinking we're connected tissue maybe, um, in, in the body? Desmosomes are, are only seen in when we're talking about our, our epithelial tissues. And the, the other place that we actually have desmosomes that we'll mention in lab next week is cardiac muscle tissue also has desmosomes. You can see the desmosome in cardiac muscle tissue. Does anyone remember the name of those dark lines that you saw in between our cardiac muscle cells? That thing I told you guys to look for when we're looking at cardiac muscle. Yeah, so Miriam's right. It's, it's those things called intercalated discs. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Let's try again. Intercalated discs. When you look at cardiac muscle tissue, the dark line you see that connects those cells to each other, the reason it looks so dark is because I have a ton of desmosomes there. So I have a ton of anchors that are holding these cells together. Think about your heart. It's, it's squeezing, it's relaxing, it's squeezing, it's relaxing. We're pulling in all kinds of directions. And that's what desmosomes were good for when we pull in a lot of different directions. So in addition to seeing it in your epidermis, these desmosomes in the epidermis, we also actually see them in cardiac muscle tissue. That's those dark lines that make up intercalated discs. So fun fact for us that will maybe help us remember what desmosomes do. They help us with pulling in a lot of different directions. 
like we're doing when we squeeze and contract or and release the, the muscle of the heart. So we've got those two junctions we talked about. Desmosomes, like we mentioned down here, desmosomes have keratin in them, junctions do not. That was an important compare and contrast we made yesterday. Hey, when we talk about protecting the skin, what other things did we put in this category with our group? Were there any other things we put in this category for protecting the skin? What else did we put there? Yeah, so keratin is another really big, important one for protecting the skin. Protecting the skin in the sense that, remember that, that keratin proteins make our cells really strong, make them really tough. Um, so keratin definitely protects the skin. And we're absolutely right. Uh, we're nervous about it in the chat, but, but we are correct that the other thing we would say protects the skin is melanin. It, it is a, a protective protein for us. Now, there is an, a specific statement on my list here about what melanin actually does, what it's, it's protecting us from. What is the thing that melanin protects us from? Yeah, technically it's protecting us from UV radiation. Yeah, so remember that UV radiation gives us skin cancer. So our statement here about I pre prevent skin cancer, that's the job of melanin. So I prevent skin cancer by having melanin melanin absorbs those uv rays remember we talked about yesterday how the uv rays go in and they mess up the dna in a cell and when you mess up that dna now my cell can start dividing out of control and that's what happens in cancer hey by the way let's make a lab connection what do i call it when a cell is dividing what's the name of that process that we talked about in lab yeah, so we're, we're absolutely right. Skin cancer is an issue with mitosis going out of control. So skin cancer is just too much mitosis of those keratinous, those cells that live in the epidermis. Or it can be, like we're gonna talk about here in a moment, it, it can be too much mitosis happening in my melanocytes as well. What was it that melanocytes make by the way, what does is, what is their name tell us that these cells make? Yeah, these are my melanin, oops, melanin producing cells. Let's try again. These are my melanin producers. Remember, like we talked about yesterday, that melanocytes are the only cells that can make melanin. All of the keratinocytes need melanin, but only melanocytes can make it. So melanin required for every keratinocyte to not become cancerous, but the only kind of cell that can make it are those melanocytes. Then they send out their little dendrites and they share it with their neighbors to keep everybody safe from the UV radiation. How do we feel about our statements here? Thumbs up. What questions do, do we have? <laughs> I'm glad you like the colors, Jesse. I, I got one, right? Hannah's flashing me an, an, an A-OK -okay sign. I like it. These kind of things that, that we do where we, we try to apply the information we're learning, remember that these kind of things are a great way to study the material. So if we can group together in our mind the two things that cause the, the cells uh, in stratum corneum to die, that's a great connection to make. If we can group together in our mind that desmosomes and tight junctions are both the ways that I connect my, um, my epidermal cells, or if we can, can keep in our mind that all three of these help me protect the skin just in different ways, waterproofing or skin cancer, this is a great way to study. So as you're working through your stuff, try to group it together. That, that's gonna help you out uh, especially as, as we continue to work our way through content. So let me switch slides here on you. We talked about how melanin prevents skin cancer. So let's talk a little bit more about skin cancer. 
to mention that there are three main kinds of skin cancer that we're going to focus on in our class together. So those types of cancers are called squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Hey, so this is not a trick question here. When I talk about a cancer called melanoma, which kind of cells do we think are doing too much mitosis? If we've got melanoma, yeah, so it's the cells that make melanin, right? The, these are going to be my cancers that have a whole lot of melanin. The, the cells that are doing too much mitosis, like Tierney mentioned, these are the melanocytes. So when I talk about melanoma, that's an issue with the mitosis of melanocytes. Melanocytes. When someone has a melanoma, skin cancer, that skin cancer is going to look really brown. Or if you do a Google search, you can get some really sketchy looking melanomas. Um, they can be kind of blue or purple. Um, th the big idea with a melanoma is that it's always going to have a, a pigment. There's always going to be color. Because remember from yesterday, we talked about how we have different kinds of melanin in the body. So uh, a melanocyte makes melanin. Normally, our melanocytes don't divide very often, um, but and we have them scattered. You can see here's a picture here showing me the epidermis layer of the skin. So normally we see that we have a few little melanocytes kind of all over the place. Remember, they're funky shaped because they got to share their melanin with, with their friends in the epidermis. If I get UV radiation that damages my melanocytes and they start to divide out of control, if you're a melanocyte, your job in life is to make melanin. So a, a melanoma is a skin cancer where my melanocytes divide too frequently. And because these type of cells that make melanin, this kind of skin cancer is going to be really dark in appearance or it's going to have colors. When I talk about a basal cell carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma, both of these kinds of skin cancer are skin cancer that affects my cells called keratinocytes. Keratinocytes. That's the normal cells that I find everywhere in, in the epidermis. Keratinocytes. Hey, but this is not a trick question. Remember, keratinocytes come in strata. They come in those layers. If I have a basal cell carcinoma, which layer, which stratum did I start this cancer in? If it's a basal cell carcinoma. Yeah, strat stratum basal, right? The, the very bottom most layer. So let's see if I can fit this here. Stratum basal. If we damage the DNA in a keratinocyte that lives in stratum basal, that lives in the very bottom, on my picture here, they have them labeled as basal cells. If I live in that one row of cells at the very bottom and my DNA gets damaged and I start doing mitosis out of control, I become a cancerous cell, we're going to call that a basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinomas are the most common kind of skin cancer, but they're also the, the easiest to treat uh, in the sense that they grow a lot more slowly. And if you look at the way that they grow, so here's my basal cell carcinoma. Notice down here, see how the bottom of, of this lesion, how it's kind of rounded? When I start to, to have a, a cancerous growth that's, that starts in stratum basal, I, I grow my cancerous cells down into the dermis in a group. They all go together. Notice with my melanoma, we didn't really talk about it a lot, but you can see it down here. And especially here with my squamous cell carcinoma, when I have these kinds of cancers, those cells kind of go nuts and, and they'll grow in a line all by themselves. The reason these are harder to treat, these little lines that I see down here, is because it's harder for a doctor to catch all of the cancer cells. So if my cancer cells all grow in a group, in a slow moving mass here, it's easier for a doctor to go in and make an incision around all those cells and catch them all. 
it's harder if I'm trying to do a, a squamous cell surgery. I go in and I do a, a cut like that, but notice how I missed some of these guys. I got most of the cancer cells, but I missed these ones down here. Or I, I do the same thing with a melanoma. I try to catch all the cells, but I maybe don't quite deep enough or I don't quite go wide enough if I, if I made my cut too much like that. The challenge with my skin cancers that grow with these little lines is that it's harder to catch all those cells. So basal cell carcinomas, the cells grow in a mass. They all grow together. That makes it easier for them to be removed. So basal cell carcinoma, least deadly form of skin cancer, most common form of skin cancer. It's the easiest one for us to completely excise. When we talk about squamous cell carcinoma, this one's going to be a little bit more aggressive than basal cell, meaning it grow a little bit more quickly. And it's doing this little thing where it grows down in those little fingers of cells, right? We can see our little, little line down here. With squamous cell carcinoma, the kinds of cells that become cancerous are what they've labeled in our picture here. They're calling these guys squamous cells. We know more specifically, though, we, we could name the stratum that these squamous cells are inside of. What's the name of the stratum in the epidermis that's right above stratum basal? Here's stratum basal, which means this pink stuff is stratum, yeah, stratum spinosum. So when I talk about a squamous cell carcinoma, that's going to be stratum spinosum, stratum spinosum, where these ones start. Stratum basal is where a basal cell carcinoma originates. Stratum spinosum is where a squamous cell carcinoma originates. So we said basal cell, easiest to treat, slowest growing. Squamous cell grows a little bit faster, a little bit harder to treat. For my friends who worked through this, this guided lesson already, melanomas, easy or hard to treat. Do we remember? Melanoma, easy or hard? Yeah, melanoma is hard to treat. Melanoma grows really quickly, which is why it's really important to catch melanomas early on. Yeah, they grow out of control. And here's a word that, that we need to know, whether we're talking about skin cancer or any other kind of cancer in the body, the word is metastasize, metastasize. What this word means is spread. Cancer metastasizes or it spreads to other parts of the body. The reason this word metastasize is important is because when we start talking about staging a melanoma, our, one of the biggest ways we can tell where we're at in our, our melanoma is has it or hasn't it metastasized? Has it or hasn't it spread to other parts of the body? So um, the other way you'll, you'll see this spelled metastasis. Um, metastasis is a place in the body where the cancer has spread to. So a cancer cell can metastasize, it can spread, or if it goes from being a melanoma in the skin and it goes somewhere else like the lungs, for example, we would call the tumor that's in the lung a metastasis, a place where that cancer spread to. So three types of skin cancer that we can see here. We've talked about how those cancers are different. Um, Let's talk a little bit, I want to focus a little bit more just on, on melanoma. So let's go to uh, this picture in your, your lesson outline. Can you help me out in the chat? Which page do we talk about the stages of melanoma? Okay, we're on page eight. Okay, page eight, we've got a picture here, and it is showing me the four stages that we have of, of melanoma. You probably know though, because you've have heard of, of patients that have cancer in general, these, these general stages are correct for other cancers too. Um, so if we talk about a stage four cancer, that, that word stage four always means the same thing. Same thing here with stage three. Um, depending on the type of cancer, these lower stages might mean slightly different stuff, but stage three and stage four is always the same. 
So let's start with, with stage four. Stage four is, is the most serious stage of melanoma or of any skin or any kind of cancer in the body. Stage four cancer is when we have that thing going on that we just talked about, metastasis, metastasis. So we have spreading happening. When we're talking specifically about melanoma, skin cancer, this type of cancer, some of the places that melanoma is most likely to spread, places like the lungs, places like the liver, or it might spread to other parts of the skin. So for example, maybe you have a melanoma on your back. It's possible that you'd end up with a melanoma on your leg or on your arm because those cells metastasized because they traveled. So a stage four skin cancer, if someone has a stage four melanoma, they have their original cancerous lesion and then they've got the other places in the body where those cells went. The way that a melanoma can get to these other places in the body is by using the lymphatic system. So that's something we talked about in, in lab, the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a system that works hand in hand with the immune system. So that's where your white blood cells travel throughout the body using the lymphatic system. But the big thing with the lymphatic system that's problematic for cancer is that it's kind of like a super highway that connects all the different places in your body. So we have places in our body called lymph nodes. Those are the things that your doctor feels in your neck, but we also have them all over the body. Got them in your armpits, you got them in your legs. Lymph nodes are places where we have immune reactions. We connect all of the lymph nodes in your body to each other and we have this big system of lymphatic vessels, just like blood vessels, that are going all over the body. So a stage three cancer is when the cancer cells from wherever they started get into lymph nodes. The challenge with, with cancer cells getting into lymph nodes is once I'm in a lymph node, I'm on my super highway. I'm going throughout the body. I have great potential to metastasize to other organs. If I'm just in the lymph nodes, if I'm not in other places, I'm a stage three cancer. If I'm other places, that's a stage four. Let's talk specifically though about melanoma, how it gets to those lymph nodes. That's what happens in these lower stages that I see right here. When I talk about stage zero, stage one, or stage two melanoma, you can think about the same kind of things that we thought about with our burns. So a first degree burn, a second degree burn, a third degree burn, the parts of the skin that are affected by a stage zero, stage one, and stage two skin cancer kind of pair up with them. So let me, let me make a note here. First degree burn, that's gonna be most like a stage zero skin cancer. When we talked about a first degree burn, just one layer of the skin was damaged, that outermost layer of the skin. That's the epidermis. Stage zero melanoma is when my cancerous melanocytes are only found in the epidermis. They have not spread anywhere. We would love to catch all of our skin cancers in stage zero. That would be the best because there's no spreading at all. When I move to stage one, this is gonna be similar to a second degree burn. In a second degree burn, we damage the epidermis and the papillary layer of the dermis. In a stage one melanoma, we've got cancerous cells in the epidermis and they've started to go into the dermis as well, into that papillary layer of, of the dermis up at the very top. By the time we hit stage three, stage two melanoma, we've really traveled all the way through the, the dermis layer. Now we're down into the reticular layer of the dermis. Now we're bumping into some of those accessory structures where it, it really gets dicey though, like we talked about, is if I get all the way to stage three. If we go all the way down into the hypodermis, that's where I start to see my lymph nodes. That's where I start to see the lymphatic vessels that's going to lead to my cancer cells being able to go everywhere in the body. 
So big idea with skin cancer or any kind of cancer, the earlier stage we can catch it, the better off we're going to be. I determine which stage of cancer I have based on where it's located in the body. Uh, the question in the chat is, can skin cancer be genetic or does it just come from the time in the sun? Um, so it, it's kind of a combination of both. Uh, skin cancer itself, you're probably not going to develop without some kind of UV exposure, but you can be more predisposed to it. Um, especially if you don't make a lot of melanin, right? We talked about yesterday how if your melanocytes are lazy, like mine are, we don't make a lot of melanin, that's going to make it more likely for us to develop a skin cancer. Um, but, but some types of skin cancer, um, I, I believe especially things like melanoma, might be a little more genetic, possibly. Um, I can tell you for sure that I know things like breast cancer are genetic, um, I'm not 100% on skin cancer, though. That's a good question. I can't 100% answer. Um, yeah, Jesse's saying in the chat that, that her sister worked for a tanning salon. Um, yeah, so there is a an article for Current Events and Anatomy that's about somebody who went tanning a ton in her teens and in her um, her early college years who now has, has had a lot of skin cancer problems. So um, might be interested, or maybe Jesse, you might not want to read <laughs> that article based on your sister, right? Um, but yeah, yeah, it has ugly pictures. It does, it, it's not fun. Um, but the, the goal of that person, she's now become a crusader to try to, to get people to think twice about whether or not they should go tanning. Obviously, you know where, where Dr. Aulis stands, do not go tanning, that, that's what I say. Um, some of the slides are a little bit triggering. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Gloria. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to move away from some of the, the more triggering slides. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, Hannah's like, I'm glad I spend a lot of time inside now, right? Like the, the one benefit of, um, of quarantine and, and not being able to do things like go to water parks and that kind of stuff is at least we're not going to get as much skin cancer. So there you go. One benefit. And hopefully we won't catch COVID, right? <laughs> All right, let's transition. One last thing I wanna talk about with the skin. I'll try to move away from those terrible slides, right, that are giving us some trouble. Actually, two things. Um, first thing I wanna talk about with, with the skin are what we call, let me type it here on my slide, what we call friction ridges, friction ridges. That's my fancy anatomy word for something very easy. Does, does anyone know the, the normal person word for what a friction ridge is? I think we defined it in the lesson. Yeah, so a friction ridge is, is the fancy word, the anatomy word for fingerprints. Fingerprints. So let's talk a little bit about fingerprints. Because one of the things that I asked you about on your lesson outline was why fingerprints are permanent. So we need to talk about what causes fingerprints to form to understand why they're permanent. When we talk about fingerprints, uh, fingerprints are the pattern that you see when you look up close at, at your different fingers. If we were in class together, 100%, everyone would be staring at their fingers right now, right? I'm like really tempted to stare at mine too. The, the benefit of being at home, yeah, Jacqueline's like, I am. Yep, because you're at home, so I can't see you, right? So there, there are three fingerprint patterns or three types of friction ridges that we see on fingers. So there's this pattern called arches, there's a pattern called loops, and then there's a pattern called whirls. The, the orientation or, or the way that your friction ridges look comes down to the way that these little things called dermal papillae interact with things called epidermal ridges. Now, if, if you look more over on the side here, on, on this image we're looking at, notice how you can see that the, the epidermis, like we looked at in lab, it, it goes up and down, up and down. The, the epidermis has these, these structures called epidermal ridges. They meet directly with the parts of the dermis called the dermal papillae that are the little ridges that go up and down as well. Now, what I don't like about this picture is it shows the surface of the skin as being completely flat, 
That's not going to happen. Your skin is going to have these ridges, these friction ridges or fingerprints that I see. So a fingerprint, um, bear with me as I, I draw and then I'll, I'll let it go. A fingerprint is, is going to look kind of like this. See how I've got a, a dermal papilla that's sticking up here. So that pushes my epidermis up. My epidermis is going to make a ridge on the top like that. And then I've got a little valley, if you will, in my dermal papillae. My epidermis will go down with it, and that's going to make my outer part of the epidermis go down. So the pattern that I see of the dermal papillae sticking up and down is the same pattern that the epidermal ridges is going to follow. And what ends up happening then is the upper part of the skin ends up having these bump patterns, these friction ridges that are arranged in these different ways because of the interaction between the epidermis and the dermis. When we talk about losing your skin, when, when we talk about making dust, because that's what we talked about last time, when we talk about making dust, what are you actually losing? What's falling off that's making the dust in your house? Do we remember? Yeah, so it's the, it's the cells filled with keratin, right? So it, it, it's all the guys that live out here in the epidermis. It's all those cells, we'll, we'll tie it into our, our strata here, it's all those cells in stratum corneum that are falling off. We are constantly losing stratum corneum. Stratum corneum is always falling off because the cells are dead. But your fingerprint patterns don't change. At least they shouldn't change, right? Over the course of your lifetime, your fingerprint pattern is set. If I am constantly losing stratum corneum, why am I not losing my fingerprints? Were we able to figure that, that question out? Why don't you lose your fingerprints? <laughs> Jacqueline's like, I left it blank. <laughs> totally fair. Yeah, so, so Nicole is, is honing in on it. The reason that your fingerprints don't change is because it, it doesn't have to do with what's going on with your epidermis. It, it's not because some parts of my epidermis are thicker than other parts that I end up with these ridges. It's because the cells that grow um, attached to these dermal papillae, they, they grow the same height, but sometimes those dermal papillae are up and sometimes those papillae are down. Your fingerprint comes from not the epidermis, not the outermost layer of the skin. It comes from the dermis. It comes from the dermal papillae. So the reason that your fingerprint's not going to change over the course of your lifetime is because it's not about these epidermal cells that are constantly dying and being lost. It's about the dermis and the way that it formed way down here uh, in, in the dermis layer of your skin. I, I've told you guys repeatedly that, that I've got my little four month old at home. So when he was in utero, I had one of those pregnancy apps that told me when the fingerprints formed. I want to say it was something like like 12 weeks gestation or 14 weeks gestation because that's the point in time where I start to have my dermis interacting with my epidermis. So it's that interaction of the dermis and the epidermis that makes these, these fingerprint patterns happen. And by the way, the interaction of the dermis and the epidermis is different in every single person. Every single person has different fingerprints because they're due to physiology that we, I don't think, fully understand the, the way that our, our dermis and our epidermis inter, inter, end up interacting with each other is different every time. It's different every finger. It's different every person. So identical twins, same DNA, different fingerprints because it comes down to the interaction of the dermis with the epidermis. I know I had a couple of questions in the chat. Let me look at them. Uh, so Jesse asked the question, why doesn't all of our skin have friction ridges? Um, so it, it has to do with the, the kind of skin that we find on our fingers, on our toes, on the soles of our feet, on the palms of our feet. Who remembers from lab 
what kind of skin do we only find on the hands and the feet? Yeah, Vanessa's right. Thick skin. We're only going to see these friction ridges on thick skin because thick skin is found in places where we have a lot of friction or a lot of rubbing. Um, so we're going to see this, this kind of pattern. We don't call it fingerprints everywhere, right? But we're going to see th this kind of ribbing pattern where, where there's differences. Um, we're going to see that most prominently on places like your fingertips, on your toes, on the soles of your feet, and, and the palms of your feet. Yeah, so we only see this in places with thick skin. Um, let me see. Yeah, so Vanessa, to, to your question, yes, the only places we're going to actually see these friction ridges are our hands and feet. Absolutely. How do we feel about fingerprints? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What questions do we still have? Jesse's feeling a little better. Good. <laughs> Nicole says meh. Hey, let's do a, uh, here's an application question. Um, if you wanted to get rid of your fingerprints and you wanted to do it by burning them off, uh, I'll give you the backstory to this question in a moment here. But if I wanted to burn off my fingerprints, what degree burn would I, I need to give myself to burn away my fingerprints? Yeah, it sounds terrible, right? <laughs> it would be. Yeah, so I would probably have to give myself a third degree burn. Um, can you help me out in the chat? Why would I need to have a third degree burn to get rid of my fingerprints? Why would I have to do that? Yeah, I've got to damage the dermis, right? And if I want to, to really damage the dermis, if I don't just want to separate the epidermis from the dermis, which is how we get blisters, right? We separate these two layers from each other like we do in a second degree burn. If I want to change the shape of my dermal papillae here, I'm going to have to like destroy them and start over. So if I want to get rid of my fingerprints, I'm probably going to have to do a third degree burn to do that. Now, that is not a question that Dr. Aulis came up with on her own. Uh, that is a question that a student asked me in class one time. This was was the class. I, I think I told you guys about this. We I think we talked a little bit way back in unit number one about um, the things we would need if we were stuck in our houses forever. That's ironic, right? Because we kind of are. I, I had a class where we we brainstormed the kind of stuff that that we would need to have if we were stuck in a classroom together forever. A lot of the times students will tell me, oh, we probably, you know, we need food, we need water, we maybe need some trash service to get rid of trash. Um, this was the class that I had a student that raised their hand and was like, we need an incinerator. We need to burn our trash. So that's the context that that same student that told me he needed an incinerator to live in, in their classroom together um, was the same student that later asked me, so if I want to burn off my fingertips, <laughs> What degree burn do I have to do for that? So uh, I, I think he was a little obsessed with fire. We'll put it that way. Uh, I wasn't totally afraid of the class, um, but that student was interesting. Let's put it that way. Yeah, hiding. But that's true, actually. Maybe he wanted an incinerator to hide the bodies. That, that might make more sense. Yeah, so third degree burn. Um, in addition to being a really long recovery, we would also change our fingertips. So there you go. Yeah, I like that. He's adventurous. That, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we're into saving the planet. That's true. I guess incinerating would kind of be like recycling, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll interpret it in the least sketchy way possible. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> Jacqueline is really stuck on the, the, the people idea, right? We are recycling humans. Oh, my. That that escalated quickly, right? In in the words of, of the, the memes, that escalated quickly. All right. So the dermis is what gives us our fingerprints. The other thing that the dermis does for us um, that's really important is the process of thermoregulation. 
So the last thing we're going to talk about in our session today is thermoregulation, which is, is done with it or is part of the umbrella term of homeostasis. So let me tell you how we're going to relate homeostasis to the skin. When I talk about the skin, we've got the outermost layer, the epidermis. We've got the dermis layer underneath it. The dermis layer, in addition to having all of those accessory structures we learned in lab, uh, so things like the eccrine glands, things like the sebaceous glands, we also have a whole lot of blood vessels in the dermis. Let's see if, if we remember or if we can tell from our picture. Does the epidermis have blood vessels in it? Are there blood vessels in the epidermis? Yeah, there are not blood vessels in the epidermis. So here's the word that we use to describe the epidermis when it comes to, to blood supply. We would say that the epidermis is avascular. Avascular means no blood vessels. Blood is important, uh, among other reasons, because blood has a couple of things in it that all the cells in your body need. What do the cells in your body need that blood has? There are two things that, that blood has. Yeah, so the first one is glucose, our cell's favorite food, right? And the second thing, yep, like Christina mentioned for us, the second thing that, that blood has that our, our cells need is oxygen. Oxygen. Sorry, I'm going to devolve just a little bit to mention to you guys that my daughter um, was watching an a, a educational video about fleas and how fleas drink blood from animals. And she was freaking out because we, we talk about how blood is, is how we get oxygen or for a, a four year old. I tell her it's how we breathe. And so she was freaking out because fleas are taking what animals use to breathe. And she just it was it was just so hard for her. So got to have have oxygen. And that's one of the things that blood has. The other thing that blood has is the food for for our cells. When you live in the epidermis layer of the skin, you don't have your own food supply. You don't have your own air supply. So when I live out here in the epidermis, I am relying on the dermis and its blood vessels to keep me alive. So the dermis layer has a ton of blood vessels inside of it. The epidermis layer, not so much, it's got nothing. Those blood vessels, two jobs, feeding the epidermis, but also doing that thing that we're, we're going to spend the rest of our class on. Thermoregulation. Thermoregulation. Regulation means I'm controlling something or regulating something. Thermo means that something is temperature. So when we talk about the blood vessels of the skin, one of their biggest jobs is to help you maintain your body temperature. Thermoregulation is an example of something that, that the body does using the process called homeostasis. Homeostasis. I'm curious, uh, in the chat, how many of you have heard of homeostasis in a different class? Has anyone talked about homeostasis before? Okay, so a couple of us have. Oh, psychology class. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's very true. Um, yeah, so when we talk about homeostasis in a biology class or, or a life science types class, we are talking about some kind of condition that is constant. Actually, I'm going to change it to stable. A condition that is stable in the body. So it's kind of your normal steady state. The thing that that your body wants to always maintain. We're talking about thermoregulation in the context of, of homeostasis. We're talking about body temperature. What is your your normal stable state for your body temperature? What's about average for body temperature? Yeah, so 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll put an F there. Any of any of you guys taken micro? What's the um, 
What is 98.6 in Celsius? Does anyone know? Maybe we haven't taken micro yet. Uh, close, 30 is room temperature. Um, body temperature is 37. Yeah, so 37 degrees Celsius. So when you take micro and, and you're in the lab, you're doing your micro lab, they'll, you'll have an incubator in the classroom that's 37 degrees Celsius that matches our, our 98.6 of the human body. So a lot of the stuff you grow in micro lab is stuff that grows best at the temperature of the human body, which is slightly disconcerting, right? I don't, I don't wanna be growing stuff that grows in me. Uh, but yeah, so I, I noticed a lot of us were saying in chat, like I'm not normally 98.6, so I'm right there with you actually. I'm, I'm 90, run 97 something myself. And I recently read a news article that uh, said they're considering revising what we say normal is because most people do run a little bit cooler than 98.6. So we'll see if that, that ever happens. Um, but there was some rumblings that very few people are normally 98.6. We're normally a little bit cooler than that. Yeah. <laughs> Nicole says if she hits 100, she's dying. Yeah. So especially if you start lower than 98.6, if you're closer to 97, it, you feel it a lot more, right? So yeah, that would theoretically make the the temperature we say is a fever maybe a little bit lower. So we'll see if they do anything with that, that or not. But uh, I read that a little while back. Okay, so homeostasis. We want to keep things stable. Your body wants to generally be around. And so here, a lot of us are saying we're somewhere in the 97s, right? We'll, we'll add a note for us. We'll say 97.5 whatever, whatever your, your normal is for you, you want to stay about around that normal. To help us do that, we're going to use these blood vessels and also our eccrine glands and also our little erector pili muscles here. We're gonna use a ton of stuff in the skin to help you stay at, at whatever your normal temperature is. So let's look at a, a general homeostasis arc to get an idea of how homeostasis works overall. And then we'll look at it specifically with the process of thermoregulation. Can you, okay, thank you. I was about to ask if you could tell me what page we are. So we're now on page 10 uh, of your worksheet. On page 10, we've got our general homeostasis arc here. So everything in your body that we keep at a relatively steady state is probably going to be regulated uh, using these same things. So um, let's start with something that, let me see, is, is not listed on here. So I'm going to have to refer to, to you guys. You're going to have to help me out chat. What do we call it? I guess it's listed here as, as the balance. Do you guys remember from your notes? What did we say the, the balance was? When I'm at balance, I'm at my... Yeah, Nicole got it. I, I phrased that question terribly. Apologies. Um, my set point. When, when you're at balance, when everything is normal in a homeostasis arc, you've got your set point. We're, we're balanced. Now, what I don't like about calling it a set point is, is that it's, it's not always just one value. We even said this in our, our class today, right? So technically, when we think about temperature, what the doctor's office will tell you is, is normal for body temperature is 98.6, but probably normal in general is anywhere from 97 something to maybe low 99s might be, might be normal within our normal range for us. So our set point is whatever the normal range is. It's usually not just one value. It's a set of values we're, we're within normal for us. Just living life though, going outside, especially this weekend when it's going to be in the 90s, gotta love quote, quote, fall in Texas, <laughs> uh, just, just going outside or inside or, or wherever, we're constantly encountering stimuli. So a stimulus is something that's going to, going to affect your body or it's going to cause changes to your set point. So a stimulus is something outside the body, typically, that changes what's going on. 
in, in our example, when we're talking about body temperature, that's things like it being hot outside or things like it being cold outside. So something outside the body that, that changes conditions. When things change in your body, that's going to be detected by a receptor. So we have particular cells in the body that their one job in life is to constantly take your temperature. Or we have cells in the body that their one job in life is to constantly see how much oxygen you have in your bloodstream. So anything that we have a normal set point for, a normal balance for, we're always going to have cells that are constantly monitoring that. So we're talking blood sugar, blood oxygen, um, blood volume, which tells us how much water we have. We've got receptors that are constantly checking that. If my receptor detects that we are out of balance, that we're no longer at our set point, that receptor is going to send that information to the control center. Now, here would be a, an important note for you to write down about our receptors. So here's an underlying highlight star idea about receptors. Receptors just detect information. They can't process it. So let me type that. Receptors just detect information. They can't process it. All a receptor does is it's constantly taking your body temperature. It sends its readings up to the control center. A lot of times the control center says, perfect, we're right where we should be. But if the control center gets that message from the receptor, the receptor says, right now we're reading 99.8. If the control center gets that message, the control center is going to process and say, oh, we are out of balance. If we're out of balance, we need to fix that. So the way in your body that we fix being out of balance is by using what are called effectors. So effectors are a variety of, of different things in your body. Uh, they can be something like a blood vessel. They can be something... Um, like in another organ in your body, they can be um, your sweat glands, for example. Um, but they're just whatever our body's going to use to fix the imbalance. So the control center sends a message to our effectors. The effectors do something to help us get back to balance, to get back to normal. When we talk about homeostasis, the process of keeping things kind of steady, these are the things that we use. We use receptors, we use the control center, we use the effector to keep us close to our set point. Uh, so the question in the chat is, would you say the control center translates the information that the receptor sends? Yeah, that'd be a, a great way to think about it. Uh, a word we're going to use in um, lesson number 10, I believe, when we talk about nervous system, we're going to use a special word called integrate. Uh, integrate, or we'll, we'll call it integration. This is processing. Processing. So the control center is the, the part of this loop that can do the processing. My receptor is the part of the loop that just collects information. So receptors are, are detecting information or they're collecting information. They can't do any of the processing, any of the translating or, or the integrating. They just collect it and, and send it up, up the food chain. Uh, Jacqueline asked if it always goes in this order. Um, yes, we're always going to have a receptor talking to the control center. And if needed, the control center will then talk to an effector. But here's the thing with, with stuff that we maintain with homeostasis. We are constantly monitoring these things. So it's possible that I've got an effector that's trying to get my body temperature right. We haven't quite got it there. So at the same time that an effector is trying to lower my body temperature, for example, my receptor might still be detecting that our temperature is too high. So it's still talking to a control center. The control center then is still talking to the effector. So this is the order that, that my nervous system structures go in. Somebody detects, somebody processes, somebody makes it happen. That, that is always the order we go in. But with homeostasis, we're constantly doing this. 
So think about it more like a loop, a loop like you see in, in our picture here. So it's always receptors, control center, effector, receptors, control center, effector. Or if we somehow get balanced out of balance the other way, receptors, control center, effectors, and we go down, down our other loop. Does that answer your question, Jacqueline? Did we address it? Okay, perfect. So this picture that we're looking at right here, so take a quick peek at that picture and compare it mentally to the picture we just talked about. It's exactly the same thing. So this is what a general homeostasis arc looks like, where we've got a general receptor, anything that detects information, the control center that processes it, and the effector that makes stuff happen. When we talk about something in the body, like body temperature, where we have a set point that we can either go above when our body temperature is too, too high, or that we go below when our body temperature is too cold, we're going to have kind of two ways that I see this, this arc working here. So this picture overall is showing me the process of thermoregulation. Am I too hot? Am I too cold? This is how I respond to either of those because my goal is to be right here at normal. So let's see if, if we can work together in the chat to answer some of these questions that we have uh, on the outside of our, our arc here. So first thing we're looking at on the left side of, of my arc is my body temperature has, has risen. So I put in the stimulus of heat. Like we mentioned, I, I went outside in Texas's pretend fall and it's, it's 90 degrees outside. What do I call it if my body temperature is too high or my temperature is above normal? Yeah, so th this is a word that, that you may not have heard of before you came to our class. We don't talk a lot about it. Hyperthermia. This hyper part is the same thing as when we did hypertonic. When we talked about a solution that was hypertonic to another one, what did hypertonic mean? What was hypertonic? Yeah, it was more than, right? Or it was, it was too much concentration. Something's more concentrated. If your body gets too hot, if I have too much temperature, that's called hyperthermia, hyperthermia, too hot. So if I am exposed to heat, my stimulus, my outside thing that makes this imbalance happen, my stimulus being heat, if my body temperature gets higher than normal, so say I'm now in the 99s range, I have receptors. These are specific nervous tissue cells that I find in my skin and specific cells that I find in my brain that their one job in life is just to listen for temperature. So if they're detecting uh, that now our reading is 99.8, they'll take that reading. They're not gonna do anything with it. It's 99.8. They send that reading up to the control center. Specifically, there are some neurons in your brain that all they're in charge of is keeping your body temperature correct. So they get the message from the receptors that we're 99.8. And they say, interesting, 99.8 is higher than 98.6. We need to activate some effectors to help us cool off. So the first kind of effector that we're going to activate when our body temperature is too high is the specific type of gland in your skin that makes watery sweat. Which of those sweat glands made watery sweat? Yeah, that was the job of the eccrine glands. Eccrine glands. The eccrine glands make watery sweat, or the way that the lab packet described it, thermoregulatory sweat just like our, our word here, thermoregulation. So eccrine glands are the type of glands that make watery sweat. 
how that helps us cool off is when I make watery sweat, heat goes with it. My body temperature goes down. That's one thing that I do when I'm too hot. The other thing that I do is I'm going to have an effect on my blood vessels, my blood vessels. When we talk about the effect that I have on my blood vessels, here's my technical word for it, and we're, we're going to break it down. My technical word for what I do to my blood vessels when I'm too hot is called vasodilation. Vasodilation. This dilation word right here tells me what happens to the size of the blood vessels. If I dilate those blood vessels, are they getting wider or skinnier? Vasodilation. Yeah, so, so we're, we're making those blood vessels wider. We're expanding them. When I'm feeling really hot, the blood vessels that are in my skin that are close to the surface of the body, so all those blood vessels in the dermis, I open them up. The reason that's helpful for me is because your blood, the blood in your body, actually runs hotter than the rest of your body as a whole. So if you've ever donated blood, you may have noticed that the little tube they, they kind of tape to your arm, right, where the blood flows out of, feels really warm because your blood is a, a reservoir of heat. We keep a lot of heat in our blood. If I send more blood to the surface of the skin, that heat can radiate off through the skin. I'm losing heat by radiating it off in the environment. I'm losing heat by spitting out watery sweat that has heat in it. By activating these effectors, I'm going to bring my body temperature back into balance, back into normal. So critical things for us to know about, about what we just worked through on our chart here. The first thing we need to know is that when my body is too hot, I call that hyperthermia. Second thing that, that we need to know, I'm going to process that hyperthermia in the brain, my control center. If my brain detects that I'm too hot, that I've got hyperthermia going on, I'm going to activate my sweat glands, my eccrine glands, and I'm also going to do the process called vasodilation. I'm going to open up those blood vessels, take more heat to the surface of the skin. These are the things that I do when my body is too hot. These are my effectors. We're going to be more familiar with this word over here. What if my body temperature is too low? What do we call it when the body temperature is too low? What's that one? Yeah, that one, too low or below normal, is hypothermia. Hypothermia. Hypothermia is when your, your body temperature is lower than the set point, lower, lower than normal. Now, check this out. Here's an important thing about thermal regulation. When my body temperature gets too, too cold, when it's falling, because it's finally cold outside, right? We'll get like our three cold days in February in Texas. Then it'll be hot again. So we get our three cold days. We've got the stimulus of cold. Notice that what detects the fact that we're cold, detects that stimuli, are the exact same cells that detect when we're too hot. Receptors, remember, all their job is, is to collect information. They don't process it at all. So whether the information they collect is that I'm at 99.6 or whether the information they collect is that I'm at 97.2, they're just collecting that information. They collect that information, they send it to the control center, the same place in the brain, except this time the control center got a message that says my temperature is too low. It's not too high anymore, it's too low. If the control center finds out that the temperature is too low, I need to find a way or I need to activate effectors that are going to help me to warm up. The first effector that I'm going to activate is, is a type of muscle tissue that when it contracts makes a bunch of heat for me. 
this type of, of muscle tissue, when it contracts, makes me shiver. Do we know which kind of muscle tissue makes us shiver? Yeah, so, so the type of muscle tissue that makes you shiver is skeletal muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle tissue. Because that's attached to your bones and our bones start moving, right? So skeletal muscle tissue, when I do the process of muscle contraction, it generates a lot of heat. Your skeletal muscles actually in general are uh, one of the biggest ways that we maintain your overall body temperature. So the fact that we're constantly contracting at least a few of our muscles to be sitting up, uh, our posture helps to, to keep us at the right temperature. So I, I activate skeletal muscle tissue to increase movement when I move. So I'll add a note here. So shivering, which is going to make heat. That's a, a byproduct that's left over after you, you do contraction. Uh, I, I'm going to activate my skeletal muscles to make my body shiver to, to generate heat. The other thing I'm going to do when I'm feeling really cold is I'm going to activate my blood vessels. Again, I have, have blood vessels that I'm going to talk to. But this time, if the control center figured out that I'm too, too cold, this time the message I'm going to send to my blood vessels is I'm going to send the message vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. What's going to happen to the size of a blood vessel? If I do vasoconstriction, yeah, constriction means we're going to shrink, right? We're going to get smaller. Remember up here when we were talking about the reason I did vasodilation was because my blood is hot. If I send more of it to the skin, I lose that heat. If I'm cold, I don't want to be sending my extra heat out to the surface of my skin because I would just lose it. It would just go out into the environment. So what your body actually does is it does vasoconstriction. We squeeze those blood vessels smaller to make sure that more of that warm blood goes to your abdominal pelvic cavity, for example, where all those organs are. All of my favorite system organs, those digestive system organs, we want to make sure they stay the right temperature. So we stop sending blood out to the skin. Instead, we send that blood to those organs to, to keep those organs warm. This is the reason, by the way, when you go outside and you start to look a little bit pale or in extreme hypothermia, this is why your lips will, will turn a blue color because we're not sending blood to those places. We stop sending blood there. So uh, blood vessels, we shrink them when we're too cold to save heat. Skeletal muscles, we activate them to generate more heat. All of these are things that we do when our control center processes that we're too cold, that we have hypothermia. There's a good question in the chat, how the erector pili muscle factors into this. So if we were an animal that had a really thick coat, the con contraction of the erector pili muscle that makes our hair stand up, if, if I had a ton of hair everywhere on my body and it was really thick, contracting that muscle would also generate a whole bunch of heat. Since I'm not a, a bear or a dog or, or something with really thick um, hair, it, it's not gonna help me a ton to contract my little erector pili muscles. It helps animals a lot more. Um, but, but the erector pili muscles, it, it makes goosebumps. That's, we make goosebumps when we're cold, right? Um, that's the, the physiological or maybe the, the evolutionary um, reason that we make goosebumps is because if we had a really thick coat like those animals did, that would generate a lot of heat by itself as well. So in humans, the erector pili muscle doesn't help a lot. Um, it helps more in animals. It's mostly those skeletal muscles to do the big picture shivering and those blood vessels that, that we shrink back down. Uh, I don't know if I quite understand your question, Gloria. By finding the coat for heat, 
Um, like the, the, are you talking about like the fur coat on the animals? Um, because the other thing that it does when I make the hair stand up is it, it makes a little, basically a little heat bubble. Um, so, so goosebumps are really great for animals to keep them warm. I guess if we were like super hairy, uh, it would help us too. That'd be a reason not to shave this winter, right? <laughs> keep those hairy legs. <laughs> yeah, we need a jacket. <laughs> we do. Unless you're super hairy. Apparently, like Jesse's dad. <laughs> okay, I know we've got a request to talk about positive feedback. That's totally on my radar. That's the last thing we're going to do. Are there any last minute questions, though, about this? This is negative feedback. Are there any last minute questions about what we just talked about here? Or shoot me an emoji that shows me how you're feeling. Doesn't have to be a good feeling if we're not feeling good yet. I'm gonna find an emoji to send to you. Here, here's the emoji I'm gonna send. Oh yeah, Gloria had the same idea. I got some hypothermia going on, or I'm gonna pretend I do, put it that way. Okay, before I flip slides then, let me mention something, and I said it before. When we talk about thermoregulation, and you'll read more about this in, in your lesson, thermoregulation is an example of a negative feedback loop. Negative feedback loop. What happens with a negative feedback loop is that my effectors do the opposite of my stimulus. So what I do in response to what I detect is the opposite of what what my stimulus was so when i have hyperthermia when i'm too hot i'm going to activate effectors that make me cool off when i have hypothermia when i'm too cold i'm going to activate effectors that make me warmer with a negative feedback loop i do the opposite of the stimulus that i received the goal with the negative feedback loop is always to get back to normal, to that set point. So whether it's the right temperature, whether it's the right blood sugar, I always want to get back to that normal that I started with. My effectors do the opposite of, of what my stimulus was. When we talk about a positive feedback loop, a positive, feedback loop. In a positive feedback loop, something changes, I have a stimulus, but then I spend some time um, making that stimulus happen over and over and over again. So rather than my effectors doing the opposite of the stimulus, my effectors do the same thing as the stimulus. So a really good example of a positive feedback loop is the process of blood clotting, blood clotting. So let's look at this. Blood clotting is what, what I need my body to do when I have damaged a blood vessel. So we'll, we'll say we're like Dr. Aulis and we're a little bit clumsy. Um, so we're walking around in the middle of the night feeding a four month old, right, in the dark, and you bump into the coffee table. And when you bump into the coffee table, you break some blood vessels, we're gonna get a bruise but we don't want to bleed out because we broke a blood vessel. So I've got a blood vessel that's been damaged because I bumped into that coffee table. When you damage a blood vessel, when you break it, what happens is we release some chemicals that activates things called platelets. So platelets see the message that we broke a blood vessel. They, they freak out and literally um, explode, basically. They spit out a bunch of chemicals that make us form proteins, blood clotting proteins. So first thing that happened, my stimulus is I tore my blood vessel. Blood is leaking out. First thing then that's gonna happen in response to that is platelets are gonna come to the scene, spit out SOS messages. Those SOS messages are going to cause other platelets to come to the scene of the blood vessel tear. They're gonna spit out SOS messages which is gonna cause more platelets to come to the scene, spit out SOS messages, and we go on and on and on in this circle of doing the same thing 
until I'm no longer losing blood out of that blood vessel. So we, what happened is platelets spit out an SOS. That made other platelets do the same thing as those first platelets. And when other ones do that same thing, again, even more will do it. We keep going in this circle of doing the exact same thing until we've reached a new set point, until we've built a blood clot. So in a positive feedback loop, we don't do the opposite uh, of what first happened. We actually do the same thing repeatedly until we make what, what we might call a new normal. That's kind of how we refer to it in the guided lesson, a new normal. Cannot spell. There we go. New normal. In a negative feedback loop, we're always going back to the original normal. We're always trying to get back to the right temperature, go there as quickly as possible. With a positive feedback loop, well, I mean, we'll get back to the old normal eventually. But for now, we're just having fun doing something new. We're, we're going to repeat this cycle over and over and over again until we've built a blood clot. Yeah, so Christina's question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this one to the class. Um, she asked if it would potentially be a bad thing if positive feedback loops happened forever. What are our thoughts about that? What do you guys think? Yeah, exactly. So a couple of us are, are honing into problems with this blood clotting system. Um, yeah, heart attacks and strokes. Um, hey, this is one of the, the scary things with, uh, with COVID-19 is it's causing clotting issues. Um, th there was an article that came out not that long into the pandemic saying that they did autopsies on several people who died from, from COVID-19 and they found blood clots in pretty much every single organ. Um, so that's an issue <laughs> when, the, when this positive feedback loop system gets activated and keeps going and keeps going and going, we are not only building blood clots in, in blood vessels that are damaged, we're building blood clots in vessels that are normal, um, vessels that are in the brain, for example. Um, suddenly we're not getting blood to the brain or, or blood vessels that are in the kidneys and now the kidneys can't function because they're not getting blood. So um, yeah, it can be a, a major problem if, if a positive feedback loop is not under control. So strokes are a great example of, of when we don't do this process correctly when blood clotting just starts and keeps going and I build a blood clot I don't need, that can not only patch up a hole in the blood vessel, that could block the entire thing. So yeah, great question. Positive feedback loops, we want them to end eventually, preferably as soon as we've addressed the problem and then we're ready to be done with that. So yeah, great, great question. Yeah, exactly like Karina said, uh, hard to get blood through those blood vessels. If you've got a blood clot in there. so. We only want to clot as much as we need to, and then we want to call it good. So here's what I want to mention in closing with, um, with this lesson. You know how Dr. Aulis is on tests, how Dr. Aulis likes to ask you application questions, right? It's the questions everyone hates, those application questions. But here, here's what I'll say. If we can explain what happens in a positive feedback loop. So remember, in a positive feedback loop, I do the same thing over and over and over again. If I know that that's how positive feedback loop works. If I know that the way a negative feedback loop works is I do the opposite of, of what was happening in my body to get me back to normal. If I can explain uh, positive and negative feedback loops in those most basic terms. I'm going to do the opposite of what's happening, or I'm going to do the same thing as what's happening. I promise that you guys will be able to answer those prediction questions. Do you remember when we were talking about last unit before the exam, how I told you guys, I'm going to ask you to predict what can get across the plasma membrane of a cell and it was just based on those chemistry words, right? It was just, is it polar? Is it nonpolar? That's all you cared about. You didn't care what chemical names I gave you. You just cared about its chemistry. That's going to be, be the sale when you approach these application questions on the exam. 
you're looking for the keyword. Is it a positive or a negative feedback loop? That's going to help you to know, am I doing the same thing I was doing before? Or am I doing the opposite of what I was doing before? So keep in mind that feedback loops, I am going to, to make you do some applications with. So we want to make sure we understand them. And remember, I told you a great way to study for understanding is to talk it out to yourself in the mirror or find a friend in the class. We, we got our little cohort, right, where we always get together on, on our, our mornings to work on stuff together. Find a friend from class today and meet up together virtually, obviously, to stay safe, um, but to talk through these ideas together. We, if we understand the, the big picture of positive and negative feedback loops, I promise you can make the kind of predictions that I'm, I'm going to ask you to make. So feedback loops, make sure we understand them, not just memorize them. What questions do we have in closing for today? Any questions left today? Let's draw our penguin. Or you can send me an emoji. It's awfully quiet. Jesse's just taking it all in. That's fair. We are going to pretend that it's Christmas. I'm building you guys a Christmas penguin. If only it was Christmas, right? <laughs> There we go. Yeah, if it was Christmas, we'd be done with our final, right? The the crazy thing is we're we're probably only about two months to the end of class. We're almost halfway through the class, if you can believe that. So props to you guys for making it this far, right? Okay. Well, we will uh, we will wrap up for today. Uh, I, and remember, I apologize, I, I misspoke this morning. I said that we had an assignment due tomorrow. We do not, um, but you may want to consider trying to wrap up the material from lecture this week. Try to get it done so you can start working ahead on lab um, or so that you can start working ahead on, on the lecture stuff for next week. The stuff with the skeletal system, there is quite a bit, including that, that application activity. So if you are able to start working ahead, uh, Dr. Aulis 1% uh, condones that. So consider working ahead. No assignments due till Sunday. And we will meet Monday morning at 9.30 to start talking about our, our next lab. So Monday will be lab, and then Wednesday and Thursday will be, will be lecture stuff. So keep that in mind. Good luck with your studying. I'm going to end the recording, and I'll stick around for a couple more minutes if we have any last-minute questions.